all we heard was fats are bad fats are bad cholesterol is bad cholesterol is bad if you eat cholesterol you will get cholesterol don't eat too much ghee don't eat too much coconut oil don't eat the yolk of the egg right don't eat full fat milk it doesn't really matter whether it's refined cold pressed or saturated there has been a relentless combination of confusion by the food industry and essentially the complexity of the science and for some reason people seem to believe that nutrient loss by cooking method is a huge factor i think the single biggest big picture myth uh, about food diet and nutrition is that there is such a thing as hero foods and villain foods wondering why when you buy some you know packet of chips uh, from the store and you like just can't stop eating right it's because it has this whole ingredients ashok welcome to the show pleasure ashok this is uh, you know the conversation that uh, i um i was a little bit scared to have because i don't have a lot of experience being in the kitchen uh growing up i remember you know i used to try and sneak into kitchen when my mom was doing her thing and she would always say that go back to go back and study and she really never allowed to be around in the kitchen and uh, later on when i um you know when i sort of started living on my own for my studies and so on and so forth and then when i had to cook and i had no other choice and i realized that it requires a lot of patience and that's where you also start your book masala lab right um so have you always been patient when it come to sort of being in the kitchen or you know or or how, what's been your journey like being in the kitchen i mean anyone who knows me um will know me as being the most impatient person of all time right i'm, I'm forever fidgeting i don't have uh, uh i speak very fast um uh, and then i don't have patience when people speak very slowly and uh, and if anything i think it's the it's being at the kitchen and cooking that really taught me patience right and and also it's uh, it's looking at people cooking learning from them uh, my grandmother my mother and and other people in the family and in a sense the inspiration for the book and why i said you know patience is is probably the most important thing right up front is is it really teaches you that uh, you can't rush things uh, things yeah. will cook at their own time right i mean temperature pressure uh, gelatinization denaturation they all bi- biological systems have uh, have work at their own pace uh, you can't yeah. just rush them along yeah um i remember to the point that i barely when i was cooking when i was uh, you know in my college days i there was like barely time in the 3 4 years that i reached to the point where my onion was uh, brown like i i didn't have the patience <laughs> uh, yeah, you know yeah. to to do that right so um now you know from the and also the other discovery for me and like i said and this is how bad i am when it comes to this whole uh, you know food and cooking and so on and so forth right so when i was going through your book is when i realized oh there is um, there's a you know taste basic taste called umami you know yes so can you first take us and share with us like what are some of the basic tastes i could uh, sort of find five so maybe you can share yeah. some of the basic yeah. tastes and then uh, you know maybe we can we can talk about that in a little detail essentially i think we we now we now believe there are five tastes there may be a few more but i think the consensus now is that there are five tastes and for most of our history we assumed there were four uh, mm-hmm. the, the the newest one is umami right uh, the fact that we have a taste bud for umami i think is a relatively newer less than a, about 100 years or so mm-hmm. um uh, and uh, so every one of us i think as soon as we are born i think the first taste we are very familiar with uh, turns out to be sweet um mm-hmm. uh, and it's it's a so sweet and salt right at the tip of the tongue is where most of those taste buds are and again by the way you know that map of the tongue where they say this is sweet that is bitter that's actually wrong so all taste buds are everywhere but there's more density of uh, sweet and salt taste buds right at the tip right uh, there's more bitter taste buds right at the back because you want to catch poisons before you swallow them um and so that's why the bitter so that's why we say bitter after taste bitter is the last thing you taste uh, before you swallow something right um and and then you have the um, acidic uh, sort of sour tastes on the side that's basically detection of protons uh, uh sweet is the detection of certain kinds of sugars um simple sugars basically uh, and then um, your uh, salt is a detection of sodium so anything with sodium will taste salty 
Um, and in fact, other elements in the same, you know, in that periodic table sort of column, you know, potassium and others will also taste mildly salty. Uh, they they will also sort of trigger the same uh, the channels, if you will. Um, and I think uh, 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 umami is basically the detection of a very specific amino acid called glutamic acid. So if there's glutamates in food, you will detect it as umami, right? It's a way uh, it's a way of triggering the fact that what you're eating is protein rich. And how frequent uh, is that? Because uh, so it is. It's so the, the point is, I think in historically. Um, anytime you would eat things like, say, raw meat, um, or any other hunter gatherers would eat that, uh, the assumption is is that umami tastes, but developed as a way of uh, convincing people to eat uh, more protein, right? Uh, um, and essentially, I think you know, raw meat not very appetizing, and so therefore that umami sensation really just helps it along and so on. Uh, which is why normally umami is really more associated with uh, seafood and and meat rather than vegetarian foods. That said. Uh, there are certain vegetarian sources of glutamates uh, that people don't realize. You know, tomatoes are a great example, right? So we, we use tomatoes in everything, right? So, you know, when the tomato price goes up, I mean, everybody is annoyed. Uh, because Not because, you know, what taste do you think a, a, a tomato brings? It's not very sour. I mean, not really sweet. I mean, it's umami, right? So that's really what it is. Uh, it makes everything savory, right? So that's, that's really what umami is a sense of meaty savoriness. Right? Mm. So you get that only from, uh, uh, in vegetarian sources, you get them from mushrooms, you get them from tomatoes, you also get them from Parmesan cheese. Mm. Uh, so anything fermented, right, so idli, uh, kanji, and all of those kinds of things is going to have free glutamates. Uh, because the bacteria or yeast is going to break the protein, etc. and generate smaller amino acids and glutamic acid is one of them. And once you have free glutamates, you know, that's what really triggers the uh, umami. Seaweed is very high in it. So Japanese cooking, because they cook everything in like bonito flakes, which is from the skin of the tuna, as well as seaweed, it's very, very high in glutamates. In fact, Ajinomoto, the company, uh, was synthesized from seaweed. Uh, so that's how uh, monosodium glutamate was, was actually made and then marketed by, by that company and so on in Japan. Hmm. That's really interesting. And, you know, while you were sharing about hunter gatherers, you know, thoughts sort of came into my mind, and I'm sure you've done a lot of research. It, isn't it really interesting that we started off by eating meats and, uh, you know, just like pretty much a, a single taste uh, per se, or maybe yeah. depending on different animals, a little bit of hair in there. But then now yes. when we look at where we are, and if we yes. particularly look at India, the kind of taste and flavor and so on and so forth like how has that sort of come about like our own exploration of adding a lot of stuff to our food it's quite interesting right so i think it's a um it's it's weirdly enough it's actually the exact opposite so it's estimated that hunter gatherers um actually ate a greater diversity of foods than we do today right so you know so the thing is that you look at a single dish and you kind of think look i'm eating i'm eating rice i'm eating dal and there's a side dish and then there's a maybe a chicken fry or a fish fry on the side and there's a salad i'm, I'm eating yogurt so there is just it feels like a lot um but when you think about the fact that hunter uh, you forget the gathering part right the reason they're called hunter gatherers is because they gathered a ton of fruits and berries and roots and so on. So, mm. so a very common misconception that our diet was just entirely meat wasn't true. Uh, human mm. beings are omnivores, have always been omnivores. Our diet was, well, basically whatever is available. Right? So that is what we were. Sure. Right? Mm. Um, so if, if you were living in the northern latitudes, it was very meat heavy because you didn't have that many plants. Uh, but if you were closer to the tropics, uh, most of your diet was again plants and berries and fruits. And I mean, you're forever experimenting to see which one is poisonous and which one is not, uh, and then digging up roots and uh, finding other, the, the kind of fresh kind of fruit um, and eating that during that season and then catching different kinds of fish and finding out, you know, eating insects uh, and eating every possible animal. So in that's the sheer diversity of diet was much higher, right? Uh, so even right now, they actually find out that hunter gatherers, societies that are still around in like the middle of the Amazon and sometimes in the middle of Africa and so on, um, or even in the Adaban, their gut microbiome is far different and far healthier uh, than modern day urban dwellers who only eat a few things. Uh, so the diversity of your gut microbiome, which is now so central to health and wellness and so on, uh, the more number of things you eat, the more healthy it is. Mm -hmm. Got it. So 
yeah there's something that you want to add there so so yeah. what i wanted to say is that i think you know if anything the the discovery of agriculture if in a sense started limiting our diet right so earlier you know uh, we used to eat anything and everything multiple things um, and we only used to eat when things were found there wasn't a breakfast lunch dinner kind of a schedule right you hunted an animal you ate it you dug up a berry you have to eat it or it will spoil right i mean so uh, our entire body is actually designed for that sort of thing right the reason we put on weight so easily is is that ancient man had no sense of when they would get food so when you got it you want to put on fat so that you don't know when you're going to get it next and your fat is your backup storage right um, it's like the it's like the extra charger you carry for your phone when you travel right i mean so it's basically uh, you don't know when you're going to run out of energy right um, and you, you you can starve to death uh, but ever since we discovered agriculture it basically gave us tons of carbohydrates uh, all of a sudden you could eat any time you want you didn't have to work for it uh, not everyone had to do agriculture so it really changed civilization in many ways yes it made the modern world possible but it also fundamentally made us unhealthier because uh, we now eat way too much food uh, without the necessary amount of physical activity and that's basically been mankind's history for the last 5000 years right hunter gatherers tend to be super healthy uh, but at the same time that kind of lifestyle cannot support you know 7 or 8 billion people on the planet um, so it's sort of a you know it's that's the thing right so modern day you know people want to blame modern day agriculture and modern day food uh, for all their ills uh it's just basically this you are basically a stone age body uh, living in a society that still has you know middle aged uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, culture and so on uh, but with you know, 21st century food and technology right so we we're just completely we're all figuring this out right uh, as we kind of go along uh, so it's going to be natural that we're going to all going to have type 2 diabetes and heart disease and so on but we are living so much longer now right i mean uh, that hunter gatherer died by the age of 30 or 40 uh but we are living to like 80 and 90 and so in a way it's, it these are just very different times got it and when it comes to indian foods right um you know um i i heard one of your uh, one of your interviews where you said that you know pav bhaji is such a indian thing but nothing about pav bhaji is indian right yes, uh, yes. you know except for the uh, except for the, uh, nimbu, the spices yeah you know, the, yeah, yeah nimbu, you know, nimbu and the spices yes uh, nimbu yes. and the spices right all the veggies that go uh, that goes into pav bhaji so what exactly is indian uh, food when we say indian food right so like what does that mean no in a, in a weird way i think i keep thinking about this all the time right and my the only way i can say this is i think everything eaten by indian people is indian food um, and i would also be very generous and call uh, even food that is of indian origin as cooked by british people in london like chicken tikka masala and the, and the sorts of very british pub food pub indian food that's indian food too uh, and i i and and the food cooked in say the trinidad and uh, and guyana by people of indian origin you know who then went there started using local ingredients but they still cook uh, things like pepper roti uh, in trinidad which is which is basically like a paratha but it has cheese it's made of maida and uh, so it's a very much a fusion uh, sort of thing so I, I, my feeling is that i i think you know in the in the vasudeva kutumbakam sort of uh, sense either you be completely tolerant and say everything is indian food right uh, because otherwise if you go down the starting to draw all of these sort of boundaries uh, and so on it's really not going to be great at all right you you you're going to end up finding a lot of difficult decisions to make right so uh, at at what point do you draw the line you know is if uh, um, is 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 biryani indian is samosa indian right uh, is sambar indian so you're going to really because the tomatoes you know uh, are not indian in origin the capsicum is not indian in origin the chilies are, so no dish with chilies ha- can be indian no dish with potato can be indian right um so it's, it's you're going to be uh, really really restricted to what you then define uh, as indian food right uh, and again what are the boundaries of india right you know is uh, pre 1947 uh, what is pakistan and bangladesh were part of british india right if you take a wider note uh, of parts of afghanistan that's gandhara right kandahar is literally gandhara from the mahabharata right uh, the guy who wrote the the the, the seminal textbook on sanskrit grammar P- uh, panini what do you think panini's hometown was right uh, and i don't mean panini the sand- the italian sandwich right i mean panini the, the sanskrit grammarian um, his hometown was kandahar gandhara right um, so in the sense that i think you know uh, and it's it's a spectrum right i mean the the uh, so sometimes i find it difficult to define indian food um, and i would at least in my book i broadly say that 
there's something common about this part of the world where we essentially dissolve spices in hot oil uh, and the choice of fat and the choice of spices determines the specific sub region uh, of what that food tastes like if it's ghee cumin etc it's punjabi it's coconut oil curry leaves and garlic it is uh, it is kerala it is uh, sesame seeds and uh, uh, a saw of another thing, it's chettinad uh, if it's mustard oil and punch for an it's bengal right uh, so no matter what you do after that whether it's chicken mutton or fish or vegetables doesn't really matter uh, uh, so it's that combination that determines uh, that that region's sort of flavor profile and so on so i honestly i think the other way to think about indian food is that it's a um, indianization i think is what makes it indian right mm. in the sense that you can take anything you can they can the westerners can bring whatever ingredients they want they they can bring us cauliflower they brought us beans they brought us cabbage and all of that mm. but we don't make that same bland dishes they did look at desi we, chinese we make, for instance right yeah we make desi chinese we make desi uh, you know pasta we make uh, we we take those vegetables and make like aloo uh aloo uh, whatever your uh, aloo gobi or we make aloo you know patta gobi and so on so we don't necessarily take those things and then obey their rules i think you know uh, there's a certain way in which we just experiment constantly uh, and that interplay of street food and home food and all of that stuff is really what uh, uh, makes it indian so i would suggest let's be generous about the definition of indian food rather than be sort of you know uh, narrow minded about it yeah and this brings me to uh, sort of in you on you know understanding um you know from the indian perspective are we more driven by taste or are we driven more by like maybe we might not think about like health when we are sort of you know preparing uh, and so on and so forth uh, yeah. or nutrition for that matter but uh, yeah. you know when you when you look at like uh, you know uh, subconscious level or or maybe your you know layer to that um, so, you know what drives uh, more uh, to the indian uh, indianness of the food i i think it's uh, uh, bizarrely enough you know unlike the west uh, home cooked food in india uh, the there's there is no line between health nutrition and food uh, you know so people really just combine all of those idea into one right because the so so the traditional western idea of look there's pleasure in enjoying just food for pleasure sake and then when, once you fall sick you go to a doctor right mm. you know it's it's sort of like a very compartmentalized way of thinking about it no india is like a spectrum uh your grandmother will tell you that you must not mix you know fish and dairy uh, uh she will naturally just say that oh today you have a bad throat so i'm going to make rasam with pepper so it is just that i think uh, uh the ayurvedic idea of holistic wellness which is that uh, you don't distinguish between all of these you can't draw hard lines right and food is medicine um, in that eating well will keep you healthy I, so that i think you know people miss the forest for the trees this fundamental insight i think is deeply deeply profound right uh we can disagree on small details right so you can of course say that look some of those very specific rules about not mixing fish and milk they made sense when we did not have refrigeration and when milk was not pasteurized you can have those small disagreements but i think you lose sight of the larger sense that food is medicine um and that being mindful about what you cook um right in today's in, in i would really uh, i interpret it today as be uh, say saying things like uh let's start by eating green vegetables right because uh, uh fiber actually then uh, slows down glucose response given india as the diabetes capital of the world and then you eat the protein and then you eat the resistant starch like a dal and then finally carbohydrates uh, is i think a really good way to think about food as uh, keeping you healthy and so on right uh, but only problem is that uh, we've also had a very uneasy relationship with modern science right you know uh, there's always the tension between we must listen to our ancestors they know everything uh, what do these young people know uh, versus obviously the obvious sense that uh, the scientific method um, forget the west the scientific method has also helped india move forward you know the green revolution uh, our own indian nobel laureates and all the people scientists in india who make isro happen it's not like they're following some 2000 year old uh, science they're following modern science uh, to make that happen so i think you know uh, this generation is uh, the, the the generation younger to mine is very much growing up in the in the modern science generation but i think the generation prior to mine is sort of like that transition generation that knows neither to do this or not so in my opinion i think indian food is fundamentally uh, really about uh, it has to be a sense of uh, holistic wellness uh, that is how we think about it but it also has to taste good right so so in in the, in the west when you're sick the, the food you eat is just terrible 
uh, it is just bland it is devoid of anything uh, no but actually you know the, the food you give sick people in india is also delicious in its own right i mean you know you give them khichdis you give them uh, uh, these sort of you know chicken soups and you give them all of these other kinds of dishes that are actually absolutely delicious in their own right um, this is also a place where uh, vegetarian food is not uh, a compromise it's not like take meat dishes remove the meat right uh, no it, this is just vegetarian dishes designed to be delicious for that given ingredient and and so on so we are so indians it's very hard to pin down indians as they focus on this no indians have a tendency to focus on everything right mm-hmm. um and and so in that sense yes they do focus on health they do focus on nutrition they do focus on taste and flavor and i think if there's one thing that i will point out that i sometimes have uh, people find difficult to accept uh, is the fact that we're also very very uh, insular and very intolerant about food that we are not familiar with right so so the, the tiny number of people who enjoy who experiment and, and try new cuisines the vast majority absolutely not the vast majority are basically a uh, north indian not liking the chapati in chennai because you know they might use sesame oil or uh, uh, a different sort of spices and it doesn't quite taste the same uh, and so on uh it is really just that indians themselves because they just grow up eating delicious food at home find it very very difficult to accept uh other tastes other flavors other methods of cooking um uh, and, and and so on so that i think you know obviously amongst the urban young and others who are going abroad it is changing uh but for the for the most part uh, and i also remember india is like very tightly divided by caste and community and, and religion and all of that so your food habits are tied to that uh so if you grew up in a family uh, that eats no onion garlic then f- forget about meat i mean you can't eat at uh, anybody else's house where they cook onion and garlic right so by extension you can't really be friends with uh, someone you can't eat, uh, cook for someone you can't eat at somebody else's food so so which is why india never had restaurants uh, as a culture uh, mm. t- till 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 like the 1940s right mm. uh, till well people really started accepting that yeah it's okay to eat food cooked by someone from another caste Hmm. we never really had restaurants yeah. right uh, it, this is not to say there was no public eating of course temples were actually making and giving food f- free for everyone right that was there right uh, but but there was no commercial capitalistic uh, food industry per se right and hmm. the other idea that uh, you know uh, that you must not charge money for food is also very tightly ingrained into the indian psyche right you know there is a sense that if you're giving someone food you can't charge money for it that you must give it free right uh so all of these sorts of things make the indian sort of psyche uh, towards food a very unique thing mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. got it and also you know the other thing about the whole uh uh you know indian food and, and now the conversation in, in the culture where a lot of people are talking about right so okay we have done all the western things right so we we have eaten our food and then we got fascinated with the pizzas and pastas and what not and then now we are all of a sudden realizing that hey wait a second like in fact our indian food in itself like home cooked indian food in itself was something that i should uh you know continue to eat because that's way healthier than uh you know um then like you know the the what we try to sort of uh, pick fr- from the modern foods uh which are like quick I, per right. se so i i'll push back a little bit on that right yeah. I, i think there is again a natural tendency to want to blame with the pizzas and the, uh, and the, and and the, the snacks and so on um a pizza is not particularly any more unhealthy than a samosa okay uh, or 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 a or a kachori for that matter uh, or uh, name any traditional snack uh, let's be honest there right um and and so therefore i think you know there is this um it, it's not like there are no indian snacks that that don't use maida right uh, so let's let's not get that right um and again the the point about a pizza is that nobody's asking you to eat a full pizza uh that and and you can always eat a pizza that has vegetables on top um uh, and then there is cheese and all that and if you're eating one slice uh, uh and then not eating a big dessert uh, it's really that's not not really the problem and i think what people are also missing is that it, the distinction is really between home cooked food and restaurant cooked food it doesn't it doesn't matter whether it's a pizza or whether it's a dal chawal mm. okay, right a dal you order from a hotel three times more calories there is just no escaping it it is uh, a a restaurant is just simply incentivized to make food delicious if they do not you people will not buy it. and the only way to make it more delicious is to add more fat more ghee uh, more more spice more more salt 
uh, more sugar. And and so therefore, uh, anything you buy in a restaurant is by definition actually going to be more unhealthy than what you make at home. So, so I think the the distinction should not be about uh, saying that no, Archgill, you know, people are eating pizzas and that's what's making them unhealthy. No, you know, so people are obviously when they go to when they go out, uh, they are going to gravitate towards eating things that they cannot make at home, right? I mean, nobody goes out to a restaurant to eat dal chawal, okay? Right? Yeah. So, so but, but again, but remember, this is also changing because now you are, you know, you're Swiggy, Zomatoing those things home, and you're regularly you're like, no, I don't want pizza because pizza gets cold. I want to order, I want to swiggy a kitchidi, I want to order a, some sort of a dal makhani and, and naan and all of that. You think that's healthy, right? I mean, a, a naan is made of the same base that a pizza is. It's A naan is basically the base of a pizza, right? So, so I think, you know, it is just that I think people have a, in having this distortion, I think what people end up doing is they somehow believe as long as I eat Indian food, I'm healthy and they will eat unhealthy Indian food. Right. So, hmm. so again, let me tell you the 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 rate of diabetes uh, in India uh, is not different amongst people who eat pizzas and people who don't eat pizzas. All right. Uh, there are many people in my own family. They've never touched a pizza in their lives. They all have diabetes, but they're eating rice three times a day, uh, and uh, and eating nothing else, and and not eating not eating enough protein, not eating enough micronutrients, uh, and and their their sedentary lifestyle. Um, and, and so clearly, I think, you know, people are not paying attention to the actual science of what, you know, uh, causes glucose spikes and so on. It is just that any kind of carb heavy meal is not great for you. Right. Um, and yes, of course, the saturated fat and all of that is, of course, also going to add on heart problems and all of that. But I think, you know, the very same people who say no to pizza sit and eat uh, uh, thousands of biscuits in their lives uh, dipping into their tea. What, what fat do you think is there in that biscuit? It's all sat same saturated fat. Right. So it's just that people need to have a, a common sense, more neutral, a fact-based approach uh, to this. You must eat home-cooked food. You must eat more vegetables. You must eat more protein. And you must reduce consumption of fat and carbohydrates. However you do this, whether you whether you order from a cloud kitchen or whether you uh, you make it at home, doesn't really matter. Yeah, whether it's Italian or uh, Western or American really doesn't matter here. Hmm. So talking about blame, there's a lot of blame right now, you know, sort of pointed towards seed oils, right? Which yeah. mustard oil, for example, in North is such a big thing, right? You know, yeah. it, it has been there for ages. Uh, yes. And, yes. Uh, you know, I, I got time to, uh, you know, I got to spend some time in Gujarat and they make, uh, you know, in, in uh, Vadodara, cotton seed oil. Uh, cotton you know, seed, yes. Uh, right. So uh, and so on and so forth. So so what's your thought uh, on sure. the whole pointing fingers at seed oils are like, you know, inflammatory and so on and so forth. So the problem right now, overall with fats over the last, I would actually say since the 1950s, the 70 years, um, there has been a relentless combination of confusion by the food industry, deliberate confusion by the food industry. And essentially, the complexity of the science involved, right? The nutrition science involved. So let's let's first address the, the deliberate confusion. The sugar industry lobbied in the 1950s uh, when diabetes and heart disease rates went up in the U.S. The government said we need to find a reason, right? You know, we have to fix this problem because millions of Americans are dying from heart disease and diabetes. Uh, so basically, these guys uh, uh, did the did the study, and they came up they essentially found out that sugar was the problem. Uh, but secondarily, they said, well, saturated fats can also be a problem. Okay. And so what the sugar industry said is, let us pay researchers to specifically focus on fats and completely ignore sugars uh, and let us paint them as the villain. And so from the 1950s to the 1980s, all we heard was, Fats are bad. Fats are bad. Cholesterol is bad. Cholesterol is bad. If you eat cholesterol, you will get cholesterol. Don't eat too much ghee. Don't eat too much coconut oil. Don't eat the yolk of the egg. Right? Don't eat full fat milk. I mean, the entire obsession with low fat, low fat, low fat was just, uh, we started, uh, and in fact, the great uh, popularity of vegetable and seed oils itself kind of became popular during the time. The demand went up so high that there was no way everyone could simply go with cold press. Uh, oils, it had to be refined. There is no other way you could actually uh, really produce something that had the shelf life enough to really uh, yeah, meet that kind of demand, right? Um, and so that's one side of the story, right? And then by the 1980s and 1990s, we kind of realized that 
um okay people have been low fat for such a long time <laughs> diabetes and heart disease rates have continued to go up so what's the reason and then eventually they said oh no the problem is actually sugar uh, the problem is carbohydrates uh, the problem is not uh, fat right uh, and and now therefore i think that is one side of the story the second side of the story is that within fats itself it is it is now nearly impossible so that if you look at all of the top health uh, nutrition agencies all of the who and all of these guys right they broadly say look the problem is public want simple answers but the problem is i can't give you a simple answer so what they generally say is it doesn't matter what fat you eat make sure that the overall amount of calories from fat are between the 20 to 30% range right 20 on the lower end 30 on the higher end right uh, and if you're like a heart disease maybe a little bit less right it doesn't matter your overall calories 100% calories keep your fat calories to 20 to 30 once you do that it doesn't really matter what fat you eat then the second bit of advice is eat multiple oils don't just eat one fat because honestly we have we have no way of knowing so i can't tell you for sure that groundnut oil is the most amazing thing just only eat that and nothing else he said it is too risky for us to say because different people react differently there are people who eat only groundnut oil are very healthy there are people who only eat groundnut oil and have a lot of heart disease there are just too many other factors i can't tell you at all so mix and match right so you know if you're eating maharashtrian food use cotton seed or groundnut oil if you're using bengali food eat uh, mustard oil if you're using south indian you eat coconut or uh, this thing right so appropriately whatever cuisine you're eating use that fat right and then what is even more confusing now is that is now even in hard to say earlier we used to think saturated fats are just bad right now even that is now tricky because there are people who consume lots of saturated fat like france and kerala uh, and and um, the indonesia and africa who are all pretty healthy right so the problem therefore they said is okay because there is so much conflicting research keep saturated fats to not more than 10% of your daily calories right so so this basically means that as long as you're being moderate about the fat you consume it doesn't really matter seed oils i think the problem is that uh there is some here and there there have been this research that polyunsaturated fats particularly ones that are squeezed and refined and go through multiple rounds of refining and all of that um end up actually causing inflammation and all of that there is really no convincing evidence at this point right but the problem is there are enough instagram influencers who are willing to turn that one random paper out of context and tell you everything is poison uh the fact of the matter is if you are generally not consuming too much fat in your diet it's like you're not deep frying every day and all of that it doesn't really matter whether it's refined cold pressed or saturated uh just use a mix of everything uh i normally just tell people that well if you really want a simple method now use cold press for daily sauteing use uh use refined for deep frying and use uh, a, a ghee f- for special occasions right i mean i don't want you to make a biryani with some refined or cold press oil it's a, please use ghee it's okay it's like uh, what's the point of you know and, right you know that's not going to be that's not the point at all right so i think uh, it's really that so that's the problem is the science is confusing so uh, just mix and match <laughs> and be moderate about it yeah. be fine mm. so when it comes to you know cooking methods and you uh, outline different methods uh, in your book as well so from the again looking from the health standpoint since we are talking about health uh so what are some of the you know indian cooking methods uh, that are you know if you were to rate them in the order of like this is the most healthy and this is not so uh, from the nutrient loss perspective see again the only thing is that i often ask people 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 get very very uh for some reason people seem to believe that the uh, uh nutrient loss by cooking method is a huge factor somehow people have this belief and i always have to keep telling them no because it's it's not that straightforward okay technically speaking all cooking will destroy some nutrients that's the very de- fundamental definition of cooking because heat is involved uh and heat has a tendency to break down molecules that's just the way things work right uh but at the same time heat also transforms your food right technically speaking a raw dal is is nutritious you lose about 25% of its micronutrients when you cook it uh but nobody can digest raw dal so you'll have other problems if you eat raw dal it has too many anti nutrients so it's not straight forward so cooking actually reduces anti nutrients as well as nutrients okay and in some cases it makes some nutrients more available tomatoes are a great example cooked tomatoes more lycopene 
uh, than raw tomatoes. Cooked carrots, more carotenoids. But what about the vitamin C in the uh, in, Correct, in, in right. tomatoes? So vitamin mm-hmm. C is, yes, vitamin C is very heat sensitive. So, so the second thing is, therefore, my next question always to you is, when you say nutrient, please tell me what is nutrient, right? So then people have to think it's okay. So macronutrients are protein, carbohydrates, fats, right? And then there are micronutrients. Micronutrients are vitamins. And then there are antioxidants, polyphenols, and all those spice flavor molecules uh, and minerals. Well, these are the micronutrients for the most part, right? Uh, it turns out cooking does not destroy any micronutrients, right? Uh, neither does storing in a fridge, neither does storing in a freezer, neither does not, 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 macronutrients do not get destroyed. Uh, you know, law of conservation of mass and all of that. It really does not get destroyed. Okay? Uh, micronutrients, different micronutrients work differently, right? So vitamin B and vitamin C, which are the water-soluble vitamins, they are the most heat-sensitive. Fat-soluble vitamins are not. You will not. You're not going to destroy fat-soluble vitamins by cooking, right? So your vitamin A, D, E, K, none of that stuff is going to get uh, destroyed. Uh, but vitamin B, the water-soluble vitamins, and vitamin C are the ones that are commonly going to get destroyed. Typically, you lose about 20 to 25% through any form of cooking method. Uh, again, in general, you don't eat one dish. The reason you eat a ton of things, you eat a mix of cooked and raw, is to make sure that you're getting everything, right? Uh, which is also why I think, you know, you squeeze lime at the end, you've got back all your lost vitamin C, right? And it's any, anyway a generally good thing to do, right? Uh, it's always good to have a salad on the side. Why do you have a salad on the side? Because you're going to get all of those missing uh, B and C uh, minerals from that, right? Uh, and so I think in general, and again, you don't need much. Uh, so it's not like you need to eat it every day as well, right? So therefore, people just completely break their head. So therefore, the now when you think about cooking methods, uh, you really essentially are ranking them in terms of, okay, in terms of vitamin B and C destruction, which is the which is the least destructive, most destructive, least destructive is microwave, then followed by steaming, mm. then followed by uh, is it? Uh, boiling and pressure so cooking. Li- yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about microwave because yes. I think you have yes. also try to. There's a lot of myth around that, right? So one of the things yes. that uh, yes. you know we often keep hearing is uh, it's not a healthy thing to microwave your food. It is the healthiest. Uh, because, because actually it only heats water and does nothing else, right? See, the problem with boiling is that a ton of those uh, micronutrients will get lost to the water, especially if you discard the water, right? Steaming is better, right? Uh, but steaming takes time, okay? So uh, so there is a question of energy. So so it's not, so cooking is not, so people also have to balance LPG costs and other things, boss. So it's not like a, I'm only going to, it's, see, this is not a differential function where you're only going to optimize for uh, micronutrients, okay? People have to optimize for cost. People have to optimize for affordability and time. People have to go, you know, uh, go for work and all of that. So that's why it's, it's, it's so, and you don't have to break your head, right? Uh, uh, just because you, so, 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 so things like deep frying uh, and tandoor baking and the convection baking in general are very high temperature. So you can rest assured all your micro, all your uh, polyphenols and all of that stuff is going to get destroyed. So nobody's eating a puri, batura, papad, and uh, uh, vada and all of that for micronutrients. Let's be honest about that, okay? You're eating it because they're delicious. Uh, you're not eating it because you're going to get some antioxidants and all of that. Uh, so therefore, I think, you know, you're going to get that from, see, you're going to get antioxidants from the spices you add. Uh, you're, going to get, you're going to get antioxidants from the fruits and the vegetables, raw, raw fruits and vegetables that you eat, right? And definitely from some of the cooked fruits and vegetables uh, as well. Uh, but yes, you might lose some to the cooking process, but you're still getting enough. So you don't have to really break your head about it uh, in general. So just remember that uh, cooking temperatures under the boiling point of water, which is what you're going to get in a microwave, boiling, steaming, all of that, are all relatively the least destructive from a micronutrient standpoint. Then sauteing, dry food sauteing, the temperature will go above 100 Celsius. So you're going to lose some more. Deep frying is 175 Celsius. You're going to lose a lot more. Uh, And baking is at 220, 230 Celsius. And a tandoor is like 500 Celsius. Uh, so, so basically, yeah, so you want to think about that. Uh, but at the same time, that those high temperature cooking produces the most delicious foods, right? The brown coloring and all of that really comes only with the high temperature, right? Uh, but high temperature also comes with the risk of producing some of these 
uh, bad molecules like acrylamide. You know, this is this is not what you if you're eating in a balanced sense, right? Uh, nobody's going to blame you for eating two puris with a lot of vegetables with a side salad. I think that's a perfectly mm-hmm. fine beef, right? Mm-hmm. So it's really you know, people just waste their time thinking about these things. Okay, um, so now that you know we are talking about uh, nutrition and stuff like that, one of the things is uh, a lot of times like after we have soaked in our pulses or dal overnight uh, yeah. what do we do with that water do you know you discard that okay the soaking water you discard because i think that's just mostly a lot of anti nutrients that uh, if you're going to cook with that um, that will then further prevent the absorption of uh, uh, the actual uh, the nutrients in the dal right so you soak it you remove all of that right you discard that water so there is no nutrients the water that uh, hmm. no they, those are all largely anti nutrients yeah got it so yeah. remember a, remember a plant doesn't want you to eat it okay yeah uh, seeds are designed to not be eaten um, and so all seeds have anti nutrients on their outside right human ingenuity has meant that we can now take that actual full dal and then we can use this roller mill to break it open and then get to the stuff inside right yeah. so that's the so that's the distinction between the whole dal the chilke wali dal and the split dal the the split dal is the easiest to digest mm. chilke wali dal is good it's healthy because it's a mix of easy to digest but some fiber also right but it's going to have some anti nutrients the whole dal are 25% of the population can't digest it forget about it right and there are people saying that no no you must only heat the whole dal are you kidding me <laughs> most people will have indigestion right uh, some people may be allergic to it and all of that so so i think you know so i think it's always a, a sort of like a balance so with dals actually you you discard the the soaking water but you retain the water in which you cook it right so that's mm. like super uh, nutritious water nutritious yeah. yeah got it because it's yeah, all soup, extracted like yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. It's, it's it's a lot of uh, uh, very umami right so very very vegetarian umami because the protein you're going to get a lot of the glutamates and all of that so that's why it's mm. a soup base in general right and uh, in fact for chana the the cooking water of the chana has pro- properties very similar to egg so it's called aquafaba so vegan vegan egg is actually baked from the water that in which chana has been cooked oh wow that's how they make mm. vegan eggs yes got it um so for the lazo part of my life i have uh, you know always tried to stay away from pickles because of the oil that you know they are made in um yeah. so what are your thoughts on pickle uh, and particularly the way we make here in india right uh, you know um, in in right. oils so there are two ways in which you can pickle um, and i personally prefer one of the ways over the other uh, the one first way of pickling is brining and fermentation is number one uh, and the second is basically acid and oil right um, so so basically the first method essentially allows uh, for bacteria to the right kind of bacteria to colonize whatever it is you're fermenting um, and then produce lactic acid which then makes it inhospitable to other bacteria and it also makes it slightly sour right so we do this to things like amla we do this to uh, lime uh, chilies and many of these things at least i i know we do that in south india where many of these things all you have to do is add a little bit of salt less than 2% salt and just let it sit for months on end and it will just ferment um, and it will last for a fair amount of time right at room temperature um, obviously i think uh, there is it is also going to every day it's going to taste a little bit different because as the fermentation you know uh, goes a little sometimes it very funky sometimes progress is young and and again there is always the occasional risk that sometimes the fungus will get through and that's going to be bad for you right uh, you really just want the bacteria so so the food industries the other alternative way is actually uh, to dunk the whole thing inside oil and use acidic ingredients okay so inside oil uh, no oxygen so no uh, you're not going to get uh, no anaerobic condition so you don't have microbes uh, and so therefore you you end up preserving and you also make sure as a added this thing you you use sour ingredients uh, like mangoes and lime and things like that uh, and you also use antibacterial ingredients like uh, mustard uh, powder and fenugreek uh, and so on traditionally used within pickles um, and the other thing you use is obviously salt a lot of salt right um, and so these are just two approaches um, and you sort of make it spicy as well right? it's a lot of chilies and other things so again that also makes it inhospitable the second method is actually more suitable for commercial uh production of pickle meaning that 
like earlier people would do make pickles at home if everybody can't make pickles at home you're going to have to buy it from a store uh, but the industry cannot simply be doing lacto fermented brine and all that because it's not a standardized product it's it's going to be very very um uh very hard to standardize and so on so therefore i think you know it's just both categories uh, the former category is generally way more healthier uh, and actually good for you probiotic and so on the second one is just a i would just say is a is a technique to uh, improve the taste of very bland food that's really all there is to it it's not very healthy uh so yeah so you want to eat uh, uh not too much uh so i have one one question that i want to uh, know from you if you were to create a spice mix that represented uh, represent you what would it contain and why oh spice mix okay man yeah. you know i've been um... so in general my my sort of uh, food science hack has always been to take popular existing spice mixes because i like you know i like the punch four and i like uh, uh the the sambar powder um i like the chettinad masala which has because i also I, my favorite spice mix actually is goda masala uh, i think it is spectacular it has that uh, uh patthar ke phool the you know the, the 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 stone flower and very very interesting coconut and everything else right um my hack has always been to take some of these individual spice mixes that already exist i don't think i can invent a new spice mix that's better than things that have been established for thousands of years but i would just add uh four things to it one is dehydrated garlic dehydrated onion which is the powder right powdered form of onion garlic dehydrated ginger and dehydrated tomato and and i often tell people that if you have these four powders in your freezer right um if you're wondering why when you buy some you know packet of chips uh from the store and you're like you just can't stop eating right it's because it has these four ingredients uh so all your spice mixes that that are there in a maggi masala in a uncle chips or whatever it is right they will all have these four you can actually look up in the ingredients dehydrated tomato onion garlic and ginger will be there everywhere right uh, and then so you combine that with the super aromatic the cardamom and the and the star anise and uh, and the black cardamom and so on uh, it is just astonishing uh weirdly enough um i know it's a bit of it's overuse right now uh because every all indians the indians current most favorite aroma right now is peri peri okay <laughs> there is a peri peri flavor of everything peri peri momos peri peri everything right uh and and so that again actually it comes from actually that that variety of chili that comes from uh, mozambique in in east africa um uh, and it has a more it, it is hot but it also has a fantastic aroma right so i would actually i i would actually say you can actually take a lot of traditional uh i can take a sambar powder which is very heavy in chilies and use the dried peri peri chili i think that will make for an astonishingly interesting sambar as well so but then i have not able to find uh, dried peri peri chilies uh, here that easily i have to ask whether somebody from the food industry can uh, source me some hmm awesome uh, so are there any uh, you know uh, so some of the biggest myths that you see i know there are a lot but when it comes to yes. you know indian food and cooking that you would like to uh, share and then i have one more question and we'll call it off sure sure i i'll keep it simple i think the single biggest big picture myth uh, about food diet and nutrition is that there is such a thing as hero foods and villain foods hmm. that's the single biggest myth okay uh, you, you you are wasting your time if you go down that route only way to be healthy lose weight reverse diabetes or reduce the you know onset of that, all of that sort of stuff is to eat less food right it, it's not exercise it's not all yes exercise is great for many other things not for weight loss okay uh people just need to eat less food and they need to eat it less frequently uh, mm. once they do that then they can take on other things maybe the mix of processed unprocessed all that stuff makes it easier right so problem with processed food is that it will never satisfy you so you'll end up eating more anyway that's the problem okay so so therefore if the apex crime is actually the fact that you eat too much food not mm-hmm. whether it's microwaved or whether it's air fried or whether it's processed or whether it's pizza or whether it is uh, uh, made maida made with atta made with millet made with uh, something else none of that stuff matters as much as people think it does that's the single biggest myth actually 90% of instagram and youtube uh nutrition content uh, can be dismissed if you just apply this filter 
right <laughs> is the guy really focusing on that or not not focusing on that it's all a waste of time you can just simply ignore it that's the number, I, i think that is the single greatest myth awesome i think that's a that's a great uh, great tip um uh, right there because a lot of lot of places in the in the world right where people tend to live much longer they yeah. eat uh, you know uh, they eat 80% a lot less. and, 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 they, and yeah. their, mm-hmm. their mix of what they eat is also very different it's many things it's salad yeah. it is right it's not just like one you know it's not one giant serving of biryani it's not like mm. one this much chawal and rajma or one you know two alu parathas and some dahi right it is far more balanced right i think it's really about the number of things you eat on the plate and then again people have to remember that if you embrace the fridge mm. you can actually have a very much healthier meal because you can't honestly cook eight dishes uh, seven dishes uh, every day for yourself but you can cook large portions put them in the fridge and your daily plate every day has a mix of things that's a far more sustainable thing again the myth the second greatest myth is that somehow food goes bad in the fridge it loses nutrients the answer is it loses no nutrients boss it does not lose mm. anything awesome also clearly there's a lot uh, that we can talk about and we can go on and on on this topic um sure. you know i have one last question before i ask that question thank you so much for doing everything that you are doing and for everybody listening sure. uh you know his book masala lab is uh, available i'll put the link in the description and uh, you know the yeah. kind of stuff that he shares in that book uh the science that he shares about everything indian food cooking methods uh spices and what not it's it's pretty much a bible in terms of understanding you know uh, uh, indian yeah. food per se and the spices and so on and so forth i yeah. can't recommend that book enough to everybody who is listening and who has got some interest in understanding our food and uh, understanding the yeah. science in in the food and yes. you know trying to sort of maybe your dadis just did it right but uh, yes. ashok says that okay let me try and find the science in it um so yes. you know that that makes it really really interesting um so here's the last question for you imagine you are standing on a stadium and this is the largest stadium that has ever been built in the history of the world and there are millions of people passionately eagerly um you know waiting to listen to the most important lesson that you have learned in this journey of you know understanding food and your experimentation and research and so on and so forth but the catch is you have only 1 minute of time to share the most important lesson what would you share i the most important lesson i've actually learned is that uh, you cannot you cannot afford to deprioritize convenience and your environment uh, over some sort of strong will power and you know brain power and you know all of that sort of stuff that it is easier to not keep a packet of biscuits within arms reach in the, in your house than to have the biscuit there but have build the mental power to say i will not eat it uh so change your environment i think that's much much simpler right it's easier to change your behavior by changing your environment don't be under this egotistical assumption that you can change yourself that's very very hard to do when it comes to food the second thing is convenience is king right uh eating yesterday's food from the refrigerator is a hundred times healthier than ordering fresh food from a restaurant today so do never never not prioritize convenience use all the devices you can that will help you make fresh food faster use all the devices from the fridge and the refrigerator from an air fryer to a microwave to an induction stove use every shortcut you possibly can including even buying vegetables that are already pre-cut uh if you think that is convenient to quickly make a salad to quickly make a dish embrace every one of that convenience if the end goal is that you're cooking yourself that is a hundred times better than believing in all of that other nonsense that everything has to be made ground up everything has to be made fresh uh and i will not eat yesterday's food uh and instead you assume that somehow ordering fresh from a restaurant is better for you it is not so and i think learn to cook that's the the one skill that will keep you guaranteed to keep you healthy uh for the longest amount of time and and your extended family uh so learn to cook thank you ashok thank you so much it has been such a such a great conversation and there's a lot of takeaways for uh you know me as well thank you so much